Welcome to the Common Man Football Show. My name is James Cobert, and today's episode is the Seattle Seahawks draft class. Starting with the first pick of the draft, uh, Malik McDowell, defensive tackle out of Michigan State. Uh, when it comes to his production, he scored 93.76 in terms of solo tackle market share, 81.29 in terms of sack market share, and 88.40 when it comes to tackle for loss market share. When it comes to production, he basically hits it out of the park. Uh, in terms of age, he's had a 99 overall age score and 98.03 in terms of his overall production score, which are all very good. When it comes to athleticism, though, there are some question marks. Uh, scored 32.48 in terms of explosiveness for his size, 82.74 in terms of speed for his size, and 55.93 when it comes to flexibility for his size. But the one thing that I can say that's really interesting about Malik McDowell is... Richard Seymour when it comes to Richard Seymour just from a physical standpoint you know height weight and then when you look at it from an athleticism standpoint Richard Seymour and Malik McDowell are very similar in terms of explosiveness speed and unfortunately Seymour didn't have very many flexibility tests to really say anything about that uh, but there is a lot of similarities between McDowell uh, and uh, and and see more, and I would not be surprised that the Seahawks are the right type of team to kind of harness that sort of thing. Uh, most of the concerns of McDowell uh, were really about well, one of it was because of lack of explosiveness that was very evident on film, uh, which is in his testing. But the other thing was just his the the coaches, like the the coaches at Michigan State have said that he was a bit of. You know, a bit, a bit of an issue. At least most of the rumors around uh, Michigan State and, and McDowell is that they weren't very unhappy about him leaving for the draft. Uh, so I don't know if that stuff is true or not, but it's basically character stuff. And I think this is the best spot for Seattle, who has had to deal with certain characters. And I think that if they end up getting a Richard Seymour kind of guy out of Lake, Lake McDowell, um, that would kind of live up to kind of what his overall potential is based on the data. Uh, so that is Malik McDowell. On to the next pick, Ethan Posick, offensive center out of uh, LSU. When it comes to his athleticism, he scored 58.26 in terms of explosiveness for his size, 70.75 in terms of speed for his size, and 40 when it comes to flexibility for his size. Uh, Posick's main issue, realistically, is that lack of flexibility, uh, only having 40 when it comes to flexibility, because that is something that was on film with him. He was not the most... A flexible player and it really doesn't have to do with the fact that he's six foot six as much as he's just not flexible for being six foot six uh, so I just think that there's some question marks when it comes to him uh, at center based on his lack of flexibility he's never really going to be exceptional when it comes to pass protection uh, but I do think there's enough components here in terms of explosiveness and speed that he can become a long-term starter at guard or center. It's just that he is this type of guy, and it showed up on film where if a defensive tackle is more flexible than him, they're able to bull rush him into the backfield, creating a wide hole in the middle of the, of the offensive line, which creates sort of an issue when you have linebackers and other sort of players or, say, a guy coming on a stunt, uh, et cetera, uh, or a twist. Uh, those type of situations can be kind of hurtful, not very helpful, I guess, when it comes to centers that aren't able to kind of hold their ground and stay there because of a lack of leverage. So that's really my only concern with Ethan Posick is that his flexibility is somewhat of a concern when it comes to pass protection based on his athletic profile, and it's something that shows up on film. Uh, then we come to the next pick of the draft uh, in Shaq Griffin, cornerback. Out of Central Florida, when it comes to his production, he scored 50.59 in terms of solo tackle market share, market share 82.68 when it comes to pass deflection market share. Uh, he hits the Pro Bowl level when it comes to solo tackle market share, and he hits the All-Pro slash Pro Bowl level when it comes to pass deflection market share, which is good. But unfortunately, his age doesn't hit the All-Pro slash Pro Bowl level, uh, wh where his age score is only 36.23, which doesn't hit the Pro Bowl level when it comes to age. But he does have intriguing athleticism traits. He scored uh, 89.57 in terms of explosiveness for his size, 88.36 when it comes to speed for his size, and 76.29 in terms of flexibility for his size. And, of course, he hits the Seahawks threshold when it comes to arm length of 32 inches or more. So he basically is a classic Seattle cornerback uh, in terms of everything. Uh, solo tackle marks here, pass flexion marks here, everything kind of passes the thing. I think the most likely situation with Shaq Griffin is that he ends up being a long-term starter, uh, but there are some positives here that he could end up being even better than that. I mean, I may be kind of 
you know, underrating him. Uh, but the South Seahawks have had a lot of success with corners like this in the past, kind of like Richard Sherman. He's not exactly Richard Sherman just because Sherman had a better solo tackle market share when he was in college. Uh, but there is similarities just in terms of being two corners that are big who have some positive athleticism traits and also have sort of the length and every stuff like that. So he, so again, at the very least, I think Shaq Griffin ends up being a long-term starter, which is a pretty good pick. And then we come to the next pick of the draft in terms of Delano Hill, defensive safety out of Michigan. When it comes to his production, he scored 45.36 in terms of solo tackle market share, 77.06 when it comes to interception market share, and 33.13 when it comes to pass flexion market share. When you compare him to pass free safeties, he doesn't really perform well when it comes to high quality outcomes. His solo tackle market share doesn't really hit the area it needs to hit for high quality outcomes. And his pass flexion market share doesn't hit the area that it needs to hit in terms of high quality outcomes. Uh, but he does have some positives in terms of his athleticism. He scored 55.57 in terms of explosiveness for his size, 93.21 when it comes to speed for his size, and 76.50 when it comes to flexibility for his size. Uh, based on the production profile that Delano Hill put up with his athleticism, I think you're going to get a potential long-term starting safety. What that puts into question, though, is what happens to Earl Thomas, what happens to Cam Chancellor? What are they doing when they're drafting these safeties? But at the very least, you have a guy that can come in and kind of be a backup uh, slash very high, very high quality backup uh, to Earl Thomas. So that's the main thing I can say about Delano Hill is at least on the Seahawks, it does make sense to have a guy uh, to kind of be there because when Earl Thomas isn't healthy, uh, you know, the defense doesn't perform as well as it needs to. So at least Delano Hill can kind of be helpful from that kind of perspective. Uh, and then we come to the next pick of the draft, uh, Nasir Jones, defensive end, slash, well, defensive tackle, really, from North Carolina. When it comes to his production, he scored 76.15 in terms of solo tackle market share, 35.01 when it comes to uh, sack market share, and 77.13 when it comes to tackle for loss market share. The only mark that he doesn't really hit very well is sack market share, but the production overall is pretty decent. Uh, but his real issues is in terms of athleticism. He only scored 6.97 in terms of explosives for his size, 42.28 when it comes to speed for his size, and 27.27 when it comes to flexibility for his size. That's not getting it done when it comes to high quality outcomes. Uh, I There is enough here to say that he could potentially be a starter uh, based on his uh, you know production and also based on you know just his size and stuff like that. But that athleticism is just not that high to really say that he's going to become a high quality player and I think he there is a lot of question marks based on his athleticism because it's below average across the board that he ends up being a long-term starter so he's the one pick so far that I think doesn't really have a very good shot at becoming a very consistent long-term starter we come to the next pick of the draft in terms of Mar Darbo uh, wide receiver out of Michigan when who come to production he scored 65.33 in terms of uh, offensive Passing yardage market share production, uh, which doesn't hit three-time Pro Bowl level. It does hit long star starter level. Uh, and when it comes to athleticism, he scored 84.30 in terms of explosiveness for his size, 89.90 when it comes to speed for his size, and 83.25 when it comes to flexibility for his size. I think the best case scenario for Amar Darbo, based on his production, based on his athleticism, is that he can become a long-term starter. Pro Bowls and again multiple becoming a consistent Pro Bowl wide receiver is something that I just don't think is on the table when it comes to his production but there is potential there's always potential when you have a, a guy in Russell Wilson that he could become um, something interesting so I think Darbo is a decent pick when you look at it from that perspective you get a guy who's athletic who has decent production but not great production and I think that there that he fits kind of the the mold of most Seahawk wide receivers. So I think this is going to be a decent pick, uh, but I don't think it's going to be like an excellent pick. I don't think he's going to become a very very high quality player, you know, Pro Bowl level, All Pro level, multiple Pro Bowl slash All Pro level. It's just off the is off the table with him. But I do think there's enough positives here to say that it was a good pick. Then we come to the next pick in terms of Tedrick Thompson. Defensive safety out of Colorado when it comes to his production, he scored 68.09 when it comes to solo tackle market share, 97.45 in terms of uh, interception market share, 96.23 when it comes to pass flexion market share. Great production overall, pretty much hits all the, the thresholds you need to hit when it comes to free safety uh, position, at least a Pro Bowl free safety hits all the production marks you need to hit for that sort of thing. But what he doesn't hit is when it comes to athleticism. He only scored 32.76 in terms of explosiveness for his size, 47.61 when it comes to speed for his size, and only 39.75 when it comes to flexibility for his size. 
that's not really getting it done when it becomes when it comes to consistently high quality outcomes. Uh, but his production is very high, and safeties can get away with having athleticism that's that kind of eh. Uh, but again, I, I'm just wondering what the thinking is when you draft another safety on a team that already has uh, two safeties that might possibly be Hall of Famers, by the way, you know, in terms of Earl Thomas and uh, Cam Chancellor. Like, what are they doing here drafting another safety, I guess? Uh, but at the very least, he could become a high-quality backup and could be somebody who becomes a long-term starter down the line. But I just think high-quality outcomes are just not there when it comes to his athleticism. Uh, and then we come to the next pick of the draft in terms of Michael Tyson, cornerback out of Cincinnati. When it comes to his production, he scored 26.10 in terms of solo tackle market share, 90.21 when it comes to interception market share, and 93.07 when it comes to pass deflection market share. Uh, and which I kind of evaluate him as a safety or slot defender. That's basically how I viewed him uh, during the draft. The Seahawks probably view him more as a cornerback or nickel slash slot defender. But either way, uh, there, there's lots of similarities between slot defenders, nickel defenders, and uh, safety. So uh, just bear that in mind as I kind of go through this. But I, I just think in terms of Michael Tyson, uh, he has very good uh, interception market share and very good pass flex market share. Uh, so there are there is some positives here in terms of just his production. Uh, again, he's a playmaker when it comes to in the, the when the ball's in the air and stuff like that. He does well. And then when you come to his athleticism, he scored 31.75 in, ter in terms of explosiveness, 55 in terms of speed, and 44.29 when it comes to flexibility for his size. His best trait overall is just speed for his size. He's not tremendously explosive. He's not tremendously flexible. I think the best case scenario for Michael Tyson, based on his production, based on his athleticism traits, that he could become a slot defender, a uh, very good nickel slash dime defender. And I think that's pretty much what they expect out of him. So I think that that's a pick that might end up being pretty decent long term because he is that he fits that kind of role in terms of like a slot defender slash um, edge, not edge defender, but uh, uh, but yeah, nickel defender, dime defender. Like he fits that kind of role. He has some reasonably decent production and he also has above average speed. So there's no positive here to say that he could end up being that sort of role. And then we come to the next pick in terms of Justin Senior, offensive tackle out of uh, Mississippi State. When it comes to his athleticism, he scored 26.14 in terms of explosiveness for his size, 23.57 in terms of speed for his size, at 21.01 when it comes to flexibility for his size. All those marks are just not getting it done. Uh, he doesn't have any above average athleticism traits, which is what you need in order to be a very high quality offensive lineman in general. And I just don't think that, I don't think that this is a pick that's really going to pan out much long term. And I think best case scenario ends up being a backup, and worst case scenario ends up off the team in four years. Uh, so he's just not athletic enough to really do much of anything <clears throat> when it comes to his overall athleticism trade. So, and when you go to the Senior Bowl tape, it, it was evident, like it was evident that he was just not athletic enough to deal with certain athletes, and that was evident at the Senior Bowl. That was evident on his tape. Uh, I, again, I just, you can argue about this all you want, but he's just not athletic. I know some of you guys have pointed to articles from PFF saying that, oh, he's, he's one of the most athletic offensive linemen in this class. But when you use data that's actually objective about what's athletic uh, in terms of like 40 yard dashes and verticals and broad jumps and the people who jump higher and the people that are faster for their size, Justin Senior, based on all objective data, is not that athletic, is not one of the most athletic offensive linemen in this class. And I just think that in general, it's just not a great pick for them long term because uh, he just doesn't fit the mold of, uh, of being that athletic. Uh, so then we come to the next pick of the draft in terms of David Moore, wide receiver out of East Central uh, Oklahoma. When it comes to his production, he scored 66 out of 100, uh, which doesn't hit three-time Pro Bowl level. Uh, but keep in mind, at the level of competition, though, here, uh, this is 66 out of 100, and this is at a non-FBS program, uh, and the model is made specifically for FBS production. So I just, but but I'll kind of get into why that is a little bit later. Uh, but then you get into athleticism, which I think is the main reason why the Seahawks drafted him, uh, which he had 94.22 in terms of explosiveness for his size, 96.58 when it comes to speed for his size, and 82.75 in terms of flexibility for his size. He's a great all-around athlete. He hits the sort of age stuff that you want to hit, but the main issue is his production. Uh, based on his production for his level of competition, 
there's just not a lot of really high success outcomes when it comes to that level of competition. And the ones who were very successful were guys that had much higher overall production market share for their competition. And I'm just going to throw up all the wide receivers uh, over all the way back to the 80s even uh, in terms of their production at that level of competition, in terms of FCS level of competition or lower than that. And David Moore, unfortunately, 66 doesn't hit any of the areas. It doesn't hit like Jerry Rice level. It doesn't hit Terrell Owens level. Uh, it doesn't hit Pierre Garçon level, Victor Cruz level. Uh, it doesn't hit even, uh, uh, it, it doesn't, it basically doesn't hit an area where there have been starters with his production. Uh, so despite the fact that he's a great athlete, you know, has 90 plus percentile explosiveness and speed, his production at his level of competition is at the very least a concern. Now, could I see David Moore becoming a long-term starter? Absolutely. Uh, but I just think that when you look at the past players who came from that level of competition, uh, they have much better market share production. Uh, and that's the main issue I would say about David Moore is that I think high quality outcomes are definitely off the table. And at the very least, all you're looking at is a project uh, athlete uh, from uh, lesser competition who could end up becoming a starter but that's like the best case scenario for him uh, and it would be unprecedented based on the data that I have available for him to become a starter based on the production that he put up from his level of competition uh, so and I know this is a late pick and I know you're gonna oh it's a late pick blah 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 again uh, it doesn't matter if it's a late pick if the guy doesn't end up being a consistent long-term starter or doesn't end up being a high quality player then this pick is not exactly maximizing what it could have done in terms of other positions and stuff like that. So I sure I won't get into that, but that's just basically my mindset when it comes to looking at players in the draft. And uh, then we come to the last pick of the draft for the, for the Seahawks in terms of Chris Carson or Christopher Carson running back at Oklahoma state. When it comes to his production, he scored 26.91 out of a hundred, uh, which doesn't hit three time pro bowl level. doesn't hit five time pro bowl level. It doesn't hit all pro level when it comes to his production. Uh, and when it comes to his age, only scored 58.16 when it comes to his age score, which is not exactly great when it comes to high quality outcomes. And when it comes to athleticism, he, he scored 80.48 in terms of explosiveness for his size, 51.34 when it comes to speed for his size, but only 19.87 when it comes to flexibility for his size. And his three cone doesn't hit the 7.09 or lower mark, which again, 92% of all multiple all pro slash pro bowl running backs since the 1999 NFL draft class had a three count of at least 7.09 or lower with the only exception being DeMarco Murray, who is not that. Christopher Carson is not DeMarco Murray. This is DeMarco Murray in terms of Chris Carson when it comes to production. And this is also DeMarco Murray when it comes to Chris Carson in terms of athleticism. So they're completely different types of players. One player had more production with better all around athleticism and the other player is Chris Carson who has committee level production uh, without great all around uh, athleticism. So how do I feel about this draft class? Well, I think it's a good draft class. It, it, the one thing I would say is I, I really wonder about where, where their mindset is in the future because uh, you know, Malik McDowell, in my opinion, I think is a good pick. He has the potential to be a Pro Bowl player. Uh, I think Ethan Posick has the potential to be a decent center. Uh, I think Shaq Griffin has the potential to be kind of the, the mold of cornerbacks that they like. But then you have picks like Delano Hill and Tedrick Thompson and Michael Tyson, uh, which makes me think, are they trying to overhaul their entire secondary? Uh, is kind of my big thinking because, uh, you know, Delano Hill, I think, is a, is a safety who could become a starter. Uh, in, in different sort of situations. Never a high quality player, but could become a starter. Uh, Tedrick Thompson is a guy that at least has the production of a, of a high quality player who just doesn't quite have the high quality athleticism marks. Michael Tyson also has some, some athleticism traits with some positive production traits. So I just kind of wonder about where they're going with their secondary, what's going to happen to Earl Thomas, what's going to happen to Cam Chancellor. Like, what are they doing? You know, are they just trying to get guys to be backups uh, to, to help out their team with depth? Or are they actually transitioning? You know, like that's my big question in terms of the players that they draft in the, in the draft. Uh, Nestor Jones, I think, is kind of not really a guy that's going to pan out exceptionally well based on his athleticism traits. Uh, Amara Darbo and David Moore are interesting because they fit the mold of, of what most wide receivers in the Seahawks are. And I think that they'll actually be decent contributors. I think, a Dar I think Darbo in particular would be a contributor from day one in that offense. So I think that's actually going to be a pick that you should see some dividends in year one. 
and then other picks like Justin Senior, I just think are just kind of eh, and Chris Carson are kind of eh, you know they're they're the Seahawks, and again, Seahawks fans, please don't criticize me that much because, again, the C- if you are a Seahawks fan and you followed the Seahawks drafts, you know they draft some players that end up being absolutely nothing at times. Uh, every every once in a while, they draft some players that just become nothing. So, um, you know, this, the, and, and I know you can go back to, well, back in the draft when we drafted Cam Chancellor and Old Thomas, everybody hated us. Yeah, but that was that draft, you know. How are your other drafts? <laughs> going you know some of the other drafts have not been the best for the seahawks is all i'm trying to say uh so but i think this class is actually decent uh i think there's a, a number of players that are going to end up being starters you got a couple players that i think are going to become high quality players at the top of the draft in particular so i think it's decent i think you could have maximized value a little bit better but every team could say that uh so it, it's a decent all-around draft for the seahawks so again my name is james cobra now you can follow my work at uh, draftcobra.wordpress.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at Geometrix. Uh, if you have any questions, leave a comment below. Uh, if, and again, like and subscribe. Definitely hit that like button. If you like this content, if you want more content like this, that helps me out tremendously. Subscribing also helps me out in terms of just building a base of people to you know get this channel to grow and, and uh, do all that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, and also share this video with, with friends and family. If you have friends that are Seahawks fans or whatever, share this video with them. I always love that sort of stuff. Uh, and yeah, I will talk to you guys in the next video. Peace.